just real quick, there are two um, chunks of paper here. There are two pages to each pile. Make sure you get two from each. Also, I printed 50 copies. If you are able to pull it from the, uh, the PDF of the agenda, please do that. Otherwise, maybe share with the neighbor. That'd be really cool. <laughs> All right, so um, the four of us here, uh, five, because you're on exit to zero. Um, so they'll, I'll be giving the initial report, uh, and then if uh, any of the other members of the elected body um, have additional comments, they'll come in after me. Um, then we'll have um, a chance for people to ask questions, and if anybody wants to offer any independent testimony for or against, we'll have a little period for that. Um, so. Uh, the very first thing that the uh, electoral research group did uh, after we formed was take a look at what races we thought we could make a meaningful difference in uh, and criminal justice races because of timing and because of local conditions seemed like an important place to start. So a little bit of background. Uh, outside of AOC, uh, the largest wins from insurgent, uh, Democratic Socialists uh, in chapters across the nation have been in these prosecutorial races, right? The near win with Tiffany Caban, uh, before that Larry Krasner. And we've seen a wave of explicitly anti-carceral um, prosecutors running across the country, right? So this is something where the threat of a good example is destabilizing. Um, in Austin, we have a kind of a stealth level of high incarceration. Um, so throughout the early 2000s, uh, during the period of time uh, where secure communities, uh, which is the, the way that ICE gets their detainers, started going into effect, Travis County was, one of, was, throughout that entire period of time, one of the top three counties for sending people into ICE detention. And that was something that got basically no thoroughfare. Um, we're a county that has patted ourselves on the back um, for adopting the use of threat assessments, which is supposed to be an alternative to cash bail, but we still remain with 70% of the people who are in county jail right now not having been convicted of a crime, and most people never seeing an attorney um, for their bail consideration until they get to bond review, at which point they've usually been in jail for a week or two. Um, and at that point, so they're off, they're getting to have somebody advocate for them and the length and the terms of their bail at the point where they're being offered a plea deal, right? Which creates this incredible pressure for people to accept the first plea deal they get, which causes inflation in the types of sentences that we get. Um, we're also a county that, yeah, despite having these hard fiscal constraints, right, from uh, having revenue caps put in place, is willing to go ahead and spend $90 million for a new women's prison when arrests have been declining steadily over year after year. On top of that, we have one of the worst scandals uh, around women's sexual assault in the country. Right? About 10% of claims, at most, are actually leading to any kind of action. Right? So we have a situation where over and over, people for possession are being put in prison despite this objective risk assessment that's supposed to be preventing that from happening. Uh, we have little to no oversight coming from the prosecutor onto um, police departments when we have a department that disproportionately kills people, right, for the number of officers and the amount of crime that we have. And we have, we have a state and a county that leads when it comes to wage theft, in which there are virtually no prosecutions of wage theft. Right? So in that context, and also seeing the victory the Houston DSA had around their abolitionist candidate for judge in Franklin Bynum, as well as knowing that Houston is going to be running their own decarceration campaign around a DA at the same time that, that we would have the opportunity to, and that would give us opportunities for collaboration, we look to see if there would be any candidates who would meet our criteria, right? Who would be a tribune for decarceration, at least, and abolitionism, you know, at the top end. Um, 
who would be able to substantively reduce the number of human beings who are in cages in Travis County and give us a platform to openly criticize policing and incarceration. And we think we found them. Uh, so um, there are two prosecutor roles in Travis County. One is the county attorney. The county attorney um, deals with civil litigation and misdemeanors, right? So examples would include low-level assaults, um, drug possession below a certain threshold, most sex work, uh, and wage theft. Uh, and then the district attorney, uh, who would investigate all felonies. Um, and that would include larger amounts uh, of possession, uh, more violent forms of assaults, uh, most sexual assault cases, uh, most things that result in longer jail terms. Uh, so we began looking into two candidates, one for each, uh, who openly approached us for endorsement. Uh, one is uh, Dominic, who's uh, sitting here towards the front currently. So I'm gonna start with Dominic um, and kind of the, the situation as we see it. So the former county attorney is retiring. So there's no incumbent in this race. Uh, there's also very little visibility. Typically, the donations into the county attorney race are much smaller than they are for the district attorney race. Um, you will see virtually no unpaid door knockers for these kinds of campaigns. And the area overlaps with Travis County, so a significant portion of District 25. Uh, Dominic's background is as first someone who's formerly incarcerated, um, for a DWI, uh, who was unable to get out of uh, lockup because he wasn't able to get bail initially, right? who directly experienced our criminal justice system here in Travis County. Then as a union steward for AT&T, um, where he was spoken highly of uh, and worked on you know, grievances, uh, for, uh, grievances for his fellow uh, workers, uh, then became a defense attorney and an organizer of Texas Advocates for Justice, which is an abolitionist group uh, uh, comprised of people who are directly impacted by the criminal justice system um, here uh, in Austin. So um, our first encounter with Dominic was not uh, with him seeking our endorsement. The first time that anybody in Austin DSA met Dominic Silvera uh, was when he came to our second Homes Not Handcuffs canvas. Uh, he went, before he joined, uh, went to more of those canvases than I would say most of our members did. Mm -hmm. um, knocking on hundreds of doors for decriminalizing homelessness and poverty here in Austin. Um, we only found out he was running because he was regularly coming to our criminal justice meetings. And at some point, uh, me and I think Ashkan were mentioning that it would be strategic if we could get somebody to run for county attorney. And he's like, oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this race, uh, because there's no incumbent, um, is going to fill up. Right now there are four people who are essentially running. Um, and there's likely to be five. So the likelihood that this is a race that goes to a runoff is very high. Um, I would say that there probably is a favorite right now. Um, the, the front runner is probably Delia Garza, despite the fact that she hasn't declared. Um, and. Uh, to, truth be told, she did actually initially approach us, um, but didn't follow through on you know, uh, going to our interviews or disclosing elements of her platform. And while I have great, uh, great interactions with uh, Delia, and I, you know, I think that she's done a, a fairly decent job as city council member, it was important for us to look and see how far we can push our platform. Um, and I think that we were all fairly shocked um, at the level of moral clarity um, that, that Dominic has uh, around these issues. Um, when the issue of sex work was first brought up, um, I think that my impression was that he had been exposed to the Nordic model, and it took exactly one explanation of why groups like SWAP uh, and other sex working uh, advocacy groups preferred a full decriminalization model for him to just declare that that was the moral stance. Um, other candidates, uh, pick particular drugs that they would want to decriminalize. Dominic is the only one I've heard who has said there's no reason why anyone coming through the county attorney office would serve time for possession. Um, 
Larry Krasner, who is the model of uh, an abolitionist prosecutor, um, was willing to say that people shouldn't be prosecuted for sex work if they have less than three offenses. Dominic rejected that and said they shouldn't be charged at all because they're laborers and this is a labor rights issue. So this race, to be honest, is likely to be a bit of an uphill battle. There are so many voices and I think it is very likely that no one will break the 50% mark, which means that if we commit to this, we are likely committing to a runoff. Um, the good news is a huge amount of population and a huge amount of the black and brown population of Travis County lives in District 25. Um, and we are already running um, canvases and campaigns centered around issues. Sorry? They don't know what District 25 is. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, district 25. Heidi's district. Uh, yeah, congrats. So what he's saying, we're already canvassing in District 25, so we endorse this. We would just be talking about both candidates at the same time at the door. So that's why it's just, like not hard to do if we chose to do this. In, a, right, continue. in <laughs> addition, we're already planning <laughs> issue campuses um, for Heidi Sloan around criminal justice and decarceration, right? Particularly ending cash bail and decriminalizing a broad swath of offenses. Um, so our ability to talk to people um, you know, in these communities about something that directly affects them, right? Because people are shocked when you tell them how many people who haven't been convicted are in cages in Travis County right now. Um, on other issues, um, as I stated earlier, despite the fact that Texas is one of the few places where wage theft is a criminal offense and not a civil offense, the county attorney does not prosecute wage theft for the most, most part. Dominic was, uh, very eager to tell us how aggressively he would prosecute that. <laughs> Dominic would also be willing to change uh, the structure of how diversion programs work in Travis County. So right now, if you are eligible for a diversion program uh, where you essentially serve no jail time for a possession offense, or because you have an addiction or something like this, they're preconditioned on a guilty plea. Which means if you are undocumented, you are likely to be detained. If you are not, you have that conviction on your record, it'll affect your ability to get housing, your ability to get jobs. So this would be a way of truncating the pipeline that Travis County has, you know, feeding hundreds of people to ICE every year. In addition, it would be, I think, the first tribune for abolitionism um, that we'd have the opportunity for. Um, so not only, to, to give some background, when we were working on criteria, um, uh, I had been working with, uh, with a group, a coalition of criminal justice advocates within Austin, like, what would your ideal prosecutor be? Um, and I think both of our candidates matched that. However, there's another criteria that a group in New York uses for what would an abolitionist cap uh, candidate look like. Right, somebody who is literally trying to stop prisons, and Dominic passes that. Woo! Woo! So given the resources um, at play, um, given the fact that we have an open DSA member who is directly <coughs> impacted by the criminal justice system, and is willing to put clear moral lines into these debates where people are going to be trying to equivocate on what it means to be a reformer, um, I, I think uh, last time we checked, the, the vote was unanimous, uh, that we recommend that you endorse uh, Dominic Silvera. I was, I was gonna do all okay. the Dominic Silvera. Okay, okay. Uh, I'd like to say just uh, having served on a number of endorsement committees in my life, that this is one of the most rigorous ones that I've ever been on. And it's also one, and I think it's a testimony not just to the committee, but the chapter itself, is that we've, like, especially given the kind of past of, of turmoil over electoral issues, is that we're coming into this cycle. If you vote up on these 
two candidates. You're coming into a cycle where we have a coherent political intervention, right? That we have a strategy that we've talked about and a politics that informs it, and two strong candidates that can come through. It's disciplined, it's a level that we can win, uh, having worked on a city council election in the last cycle uh, through the runoff piece. And I hate to say it, but almost no one votes in a December runoff. Uh, it's a very low turnout election, less than 5% of the voters in it. So if we have a candidate that's in it, we could probably win it with a field game alone. So they're winnable races. Uh, we have a coherent strategy. We have like this chance to like really push the city on you know, criminal justice issues in a qualitative way. And I think it's an exciting opportunity. And normally I would say let the report speak for itself, but I think that we should vote up on both of these candidates, and I think that the committee did a, a great job in being very rigorous and lots of due diligence in their research. for district attorney. Um, so Jose Garza uh, is the current director of Workers Defense uh, Project. For those of you who are not familiar, yeah. uh, Workers Defense Project is a, um, a group that's membership based and organizes primarily construction workers who are undocumented around issues of wage theft and labor. Um, so they have been our partners on many issues, um, including Freedom Cities, paid sick leave. Uh, Freedom Cities was a measure to reduce arrest uh, around discretionary arrest, like possession and driving without a license. Um, paid sick leave, I hope you're all familiar with, uh, but they worked heavily with us on that. Um, and over, and even on, um, on homes on handcuffs. Um, so they're a group whose membership overlaps heavily with ours uh, and who have been work, doing work similar to ours um, at the city level for, you know, probably 10 years before Austin DSA exploded. Um, so they're a close ally um, with deep connections to labor. Um, so Jose's background in particular um, was that he was a federal public defender um, near the border. He then worked uh, on policy positions um, for the Department of Labor, including things, uh, including things like uh, trying to get paid sick leave passed at the national level, uh, and then finally came to work on workers' defense projects. Um, in terms of his platform, I think, as, as you mentioned before, it's very complimentary. Uh, he is the candidate with the strongest institutional connections with DSA. Um, many of his immediate co-workers and employees are DSA members. Um, and he has personally worked on things like the, state, the statewide um, paid sick leave campaign um, and was an early advocate for it being a statewide campaign and not just an Austin campaign. Um, when we interviewed him, he showed a deep understanding um, of how the criminal justice system specifically targets working people. Um, I think if you were to take a shot uh, during uh, our candidate forum, every time Jose Garza said, working people, you would die of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I think that's, that is informed by his labor background. Uh, he was with, you know, we had hard conversations with him um, around issues like reducing uh, not just these non-violent arrests, but reducing sentences, right, on violent, making sure that things like life sentences, 40-year sentences, are rare as hell. Uh, that, um, that we were simply not going to charge um, for, pos for possession in most cases, um, which would put literally thousands of people outside of jail terms. Right? Um, both of them, uh, both Jose, both Jose uh, and Dominic, were utterly opposed to cash bail, uh, meaning that they don't think it should be recommended in any case. Uh, and this was a huge issue for us. Uh, because ultimately, we see that thing that's holding so many of uh, members of the working class in prison and making them vulnerable. Uh, he also had a theory of change um, that was coherent. Um, ultimately, he stated that he didn't actually approach us so that he could win the election. Um, he feels fairly confident 
um, in the coalition that he's built up in terms of actually flipping the polls. Um, but he knows that in order to actually abolish cash bail here in Travis County, that winning the election won't be enough because the judges have to comply too, right? He cannot charge, but if there are any, if there are any instances where there are charges, they still have the ability to issue cash bail, which means that we need a coalition and a social movement to actually pressure them. And that's what he's interested in as far as DSA, is having somebody who will willing to do the movement work um, to put pressure on elected officials to stop doing evil things. Um, he also you know, was able to talk strategically about why um, Workers' Defense Project has worked so much with Austin DSA, um, showed a clear commitment to the death penalty, um, and a commitment to making sure, um, like Dominic, um, that diversion programs um, would not include a conviction, right? Because he wants to make sure that we're not creating a treadmill uh, for people who are undocumented uh, into ISIS clutches. Um, every time that we talked to him on particular issues, he had not just an opposition um, to you know unjust practices, but a step-by-step -step strategy of how he was going to undo them, um, what the impacts were, um, particularly around the very complicated bail system uh, in Austin. Uh, and finally, um, when he didn't know things, he didn't lie to us. Um, you know, it, when he wanted to think, we didn't know what the best intervention would be to make sure um, that local police are not uh, interfering uh, with sex work, he said, you know, I, I'm going to consult with that. I have the position, but I need to know exactly how to do it, um, and was very upfront on that. Uh, he also showed clear commitments um, around sexual assault, um, and not just towards incarcerating, but making sure that alternative measures like restorative justice are available, right? Because right now we have a menu with one option um, when you experience harm, and that option is putting people in a cage. Um, and he expressed open opposition to that, um, an unwillingness um, to charge uh, any minors as adults. Uh, and overall, like a, a clear, principled commitment to decarceration that included the pure theory of power of how that would actually get done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that, that, was, that was my comments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> until the end because I think that the most, um, the strongest case for Dominic and Jose, I feel like, because obviously their platforms line up with ours extremely well and they both uh, have the integrity to follow through on that um, and the experience to kind of show that too. But something that I think is most powerful um, is the fact that while both these men have the heart and the brains. I feel like Dominic works as the, the heart in the team and Jose the brains, if that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> both, of, both of them have both of those things. <laughs>
goes a long way is somebody's history. It's not just that, I mean, it's nice that people are learning uh, to be more progressive and we see the conversations heading left and you can talk to candidates and maybe get them to agree that your point of view is interesting or uh, you know, maybe worthy of consideration, but when you look at the background of both Jose Garza and Dominic Severa, you see a career of uh, working towards ideas that fit with what, um, I mean, we've been told, you guys have told us, there are platforms here with DSA, what's important to you, what we care about. Um, and yeah, that, that goes really far for me. I know he's like, not just doing it for now and to be elected, but these are um, issues that are important and the fight starts from there. And, and I have a lot of respect for that. Oh, uh, one, one closing comment. Um, so one thing that I left out, you know, we had our our, uh, our candidate forum, and I think it went great. Like the amount that people learned about the evil of, of uh, criminal justice here in, in Travis County um, was really like, high quality. Um, but I'd also something that really struck me because I went back and watched both that forum and the uh, Austin Police Association forum, kind of back to back. Um, <laughs> both Dominic and Jose said the exact same shit to the cops. Uh, they said uh, the yeah. 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 Uh, Which is, you know, people oh, maybe man. know what we want to hear <laughs> when they're coming to us, yeah. um, but the fact that like in the most hostile territory possible, yeah. they stuck to their guns. Um, really highlights for me the possibility of these people as class struggle candidates. Yeah. Got on